This is Inspiring Design, where unique innovators come together to share their knowledge, share their insight, and keep us up to date with the latest industry trends. And here's your host, Rushan Senanayak. What's up, listeners? Welcome to Season 4 of Inspiring Design with Rushan Senanayak. This is where the best of the best brands, experts, change makers, and thought leaders come together to share their valuable insights, experience, and knowledge, all centered around the growth sector in advanced manufacturing within Industry 4.0, encompassing various industries, technologies, skills, knowledge, trends, as well as stakeholders, all the while linking it back into education, within schools and universities. In today's episode, we have four amazing guests, each with their own speciality within the food industry. First up, we have Yana Cameron. She is the president of the Food Industries Association of Queensland. She has held this honorary position for the past seven years, and in her day job, she runs a recruitment business that specializes in the recruitment for food manufacturing called Path for Food. Next up from Yearly Products, we have Leah Reed, Trish Lindemann, and Juju Chen. Leah, with over 25 years of experience in the food industry, is a senior development technologist at Yearly Products. Trish is the R&D manager and comes with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge. And last but not least, we have Juju, who is the food technologist having just entered the industry a few years ago and absolutely loving it. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. Welcome to Inspiring Design. All right, here we are. Finally, we got this underway and we're here in an amazing factory um, and we're about to talk about the food industry. But can we start off with a little bit of background about each of yourselves? What's your story? Okay, excellent. So my name is Jana Cameron. I'm the president of the Food Industries Association of Queensland. Now, I have been in the role for over seven years. It's an honorary position. So in my day job, I'm actually in recruitment and it's in the food industry. So I've been doing this um, or somehow connected into the food industry for over 20 years. And it's been through recruitment or various honorary positions sitting on um, different um, associations, food technology and food science associations and food industries, Queensland now. Um, as part of my role as a president, I get involved in um, a lot of uh, government groups working on funding, especially for skill shortages and that sort of stuff. So I think that's going to be really interesting um, for the listeners to hear about. So, but enough about me because I'm pretty boring. I think the ladies, <laughs> I think the ladies can take the glamour. Uh, my name is Trish Lindemann. Um, I'm the R&D manager here at Early Products. I've been with the company for 14 years, but been in the industry for over 30 years. So um, I'm really excited to be part of this. Uh, I see a huge um, opportunity to promote our industry and promote um, what we do and how fun it is. Mm. Excellent. Awesome. Mm. Uh, my name is Leah Reid. I'm the senior product development technologist at Early Products. And uh, I've been a food technologist for 30 years and uh, I've been at Early Products for two years. So I've worked at a number of different organizations and uh, it's, a, it's a great industry to be in. It's, uh, no two days are the same. There's always something different. Perfect. And I'm loving the diverse um, expertise here. So one of the things that I really want to understand, and I know this is, a, this is a question that I get asked from the listeners as well, is what exactly is the food industry? Can you define that? Mm, great question. Um, maybe we can start with what it is not. <laughs> so, <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so um, a lot of people think that when, when we say food industry, that we actually work in cafes and make food for people to eat, you know, on the streets and that sort of stuff. Um, so it's definitely not that. We do have chefs working in our industry. But uh, what, we, what we actually do is make all the products that you see um, when you go shopping at Coles or uh, Woolworths or other, other retailers. Uh, also, it could be in cafes, but that food has already been prepared somewhere else and, you know, it's par cooked and that it's finished at the cafe. So um, it's more about um, scaling up and, you know, making like bigger quantities of food and there is a lot of science involved in there. Now, um, a lot of people also don't know that the uh, food industry is part of the manufacturing sector and it's actually the largest sector 
in that particular industry. So it's more than 25%. Wow. Um, just to give you some numbers, um, we are very closely linked to agriculture because um, nearly 50% of agriculture produces, which is horticulture, you know, different fruit, berries and that sort of stuff, um, vegetables and all that stuff, and dairy and meat. So nearly 50% is actually value added in the food industry and then it goes onto the shelves or uh, the, the retailers or, you know, chicken nuggets at McDonald's when you go to McDonald's and get chicken nuggets, it's actually made in a manufacturing facility. Yeah. So together with the, the agriculture, it's about half a million jobs in Australia. So it's actually massive. Um, and um, there are probably, I would say 15,000, 15,000 businesses around, around Australia, which is a lot again. And majority of them, 85% is on the eastern seaboard. So it's Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria. And, and in the recent events of um, the pandemic, what we also have seen is that um, the government's putting a lot of emphasis on food security that we actually have enough food. So if we have to shut the borders and we don't have the food coming from the outside, are we going to survive? Well, in Australia, we actually manufacture about seven times more food than we can eat. Wow. Yeah. So it's huge. There you go. That's a pretty cool, cool statistic. And I think that's showing the importance of this food industry and a lot of people underestimate it because of the because of some misunderstandings and how it's perceived because to be honest i think a lot of it gets done behind the scenes so you don't necessarily see it we see it on the shelves but the sheer scale at those things happening and i think that's what goes as a part of advanced manufacturing now this is actually one of the things i wanted to clarify i'm aware of it as a part of the teacher training we're doing when we're actually working with organizations to make sure that they understand what industries are within advanced manufacturing and food is definitely one of them so what exactly qualifies it to be part of the advanced manufacturing sector yeah food manufacturing it's it's uh, quite a complex uh, scenario in that all these products appear on the supermarket shelves and we think that they just appear and uh, we take them home and we eat them but in in order for that uh, product to end up on the supermarket shelves it's quite a complex process and it made uh, products are made in food um, manufacturing places uh, companies uh, but the raw materials have to come from a lot of different um, places all over australia and some uh, ingredients including spices have to be imported so it's a timely process and uh, once it's once the products uh, start their manufacturing process some can be made in an hour and uh, put in a jar or a packet and end up on the supermarket shelves but some products take days up to five days seven days to make because there's various stages of manufacture involved in getting that product on the supermarket shelf. And, and sorry, if yeah, we were to actually list out the type of careers within that, what are some of the stakeholders within that process? Mm. In the food industry, it's very uh, diverse in terms of employment. There's so many different opportunities for employment in the food industry. So the, the stakeholders might be uh, the, the sales and marketing people, uh, selling to the supermarkets or the franchises. It might be the people developing the products, which is what uh, Trisha and myself do at Early Products, uh, develop the products for our customers, being the, the, the retailers or, or the franchises within the food industry. And then there's a, the, uh, the process workers themselves, the people who work on the production floor who make it all happen. They weigh the ingredients, they mix the ingredients and they package the, the final product. Uh, then there's the the production management and operations and site managers and uh, even um, the accounting department, accounting and marketing. There's many, many sectors within the food industry, so many opportunities for employment. Supply supply chain and quality as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's, it's of really course, diverse. I forgot quality. That's a very, <laughs> very, very important, very important role. Yes, uh, quality assurance as well. And I think I coming from a across. design background, I think um, one of the things that's overlooked is even how graphic designers need to be involved, yeah, industrial designers, yes. just for the packaging itself. Mm. So mm. The, the sheer number of uh, opportunities within just this one sector is absolutely phenomenal. Mm. Now, one of the questions that's really interesting, and I really want to know this, is how did your industry, how did this food industry look like, say, 5, 10, 30 years ago, especially compared to what it looks like now? I think um, I, I was thinking about this question as we were preparing, and I think there's two things that really stand out most. Um, the first one probably is around 
uh, allergens and how it wasn't on our agenda. It wasn't something that we were very conscious of uh, when I first started in the industry. It, it wasn't that people weren't allergic to certain foods, but we didn't have the same labeling laws. We didn't have the same restrictions. Um, and that's become a very, very different environment for us. It affects absolutely everything we do, right from the point of bringing in raw materials to the point of where we store things in a warehouse. Um, because allergen control is very, very important. Uh, and, and the list goes like gets bigger and bigger every year. So that's a really interesting area for us that has really evolved over the last probably 20 years. The other one that kind of comes to mind is um, where we were with manufacturing, say, 30 years ago. Um, E-numbers were relatively new on the scene. So E-numbers being European numbering system of adding ingredients into a food. Um, 30 years ago, we were excited about E-numbers because what it meant was that the European community had very closely examined what materials were being put into food. And they were being added to maybe color or preserve or make it taste better. And it was very, very strongly controlled. And 30 years ago, we had very, very good faith in that system. And it allowed us to have labeling that looked nice and concise. And you knew that what you were putting in had been guaranteed. 10 years or so ago, that all changed. And people st stopped understanding what the original purpose was and started examining what we were adding. And so our industry took a bit of a turn in terms of where we thought we were making great headway in the 90s of we're making this food taste better, look better, cost less. We then had this complete turnaround of actually that's not the way we want it. We want to be able to have pantry um, ingredients on our ingredient listing. We want to return to basic ingredients. Yeah. We want to know where our product has come from. So we came from a, a space of everything needs to be processed to now how do we do all of that without it being particularly processed and without it seeming too processed. So from a food technologist point of view, that's a really interesting space because we've come full circle yeah. on where we started to where we are now. Yeah. So the industry is constantly evolving. Um, there's new options for ingredients all the time and there's really smart scientists all over the world coming up with how can we make things last longer? How can we make things taste better? How can we make sure that it doesn't do any harm to people? So it's just a really, really interesting space. And I think there's a lot of influence between how we live our day-to-day -day life. Shelf life is now a massive thing just because of lockdown situations being, you know, obviously in, the, in our radar right now. But just in terms of how fast life moves compared to 30 years ago, the way we eat, the way we live our life is completely different. So I have a I have a feeling that there, there should be a psychological component to the food industry as well. Maybe there is, I don't know. And, and here in Australia, we have a, a unique challenge that most of other countries don't um, have the same challenge. For example, in the UK, uh, factory to shop is five hours. Wow. In Australia, factory to shop can be five days. Yeah. So we have a lot more... Um, influence of large scale transport that we need to take mm. into account. So that's because it's simply because we have more geographic. real estate to work yeah. through. Yeah. Mm. It's just geographic. I think the other thing that's changed in the last 30 years as well is um, it's consumer dri driven in that uh, consumers want chilled product, they want fresh product. They, and 30 years ago, 40 years ago, a lot of products in the supermarket shelves were canned or in jars mm. yeah. or mm. frozen. Yeah. And uh, there was a butcher, butcher shop presence and a seafood mm. presence and, um, and selling uh, fresh meat and fresh um, seafood. And the rest was in a jar or in the freezer. And now consumers want things fresh and they want it, uh, they want it chilled. They, yeah. And the, the supermarket uh, refrigeration cabinets now are filled with these chilled products yeah. that uh, consumers are wanting. So, and that's part of the food technologist's role as well is to, to keep it safe keep these foods safe so that consumers are safe and making sure that it's fresh and it looks really good and appealing and people want to buy it and take it home and cook it. So 30 years ago, the um, households were preparing meals from scratch, from uh, raw ingredients and uh, preparing a meal often took up to two hours. So now because of our lifestyle has changed and we're, we're doing a lot more things and we're time poor, people want to be able to, uh, to uh, 
prepare in the kitchen on the table in 20 minutes. So that's common common, uh, common speak. Yeah. Common speak is 20 minutes. Yeah. So kitchen to, to the t table in 20 minutes. And uh, that's what the supermarkets are wanting to sell as well, fresh product. And uh, that's the food technologist's role is to make sure that that can happen. Yeah. To and I think this is that. a very good segue to understand compared to back then, the, the, the sheer amount of technology integration to our lives as well as how we work, learn, everything is skyrocketing and the way we learned 10 years ago or where we cooked 10 years ago is very different to now. So how did the technology, this is almost a two part question I want to know, I guess, but how did the food technology get affected within the industry? And how do you, what are the types of technologies that you use now within your work? Are there influences of robotics, um, big data, IoT, um, virtual reality? Where do those technologies fit in? Yeah, I guess, again, if we compare it to 30 years ago, uh, there was uh, a lot of smaller companies uh, that were producing short production runs. Mm -hmm. Now, there's larger companies and the smaller companies, are, they're still there and there's still a few startups, but not as many small companies. They're large companies doing large production runs. So 30 years ago, uh, everything was uh, uh, hand recorded and a lot of hands-on and a lot of uh, manual labor in preparing, in, in, in even moving pallets and um, moving boxes yeah. in, in say the environment we are now. But now everything's a lot more automated. And I'll give you an example of, of robotics in, uh, say, a pie factory, a pie manufacturing patch, factory. There's robotic arms that come out and pick up the pies after they've been cooked and, and put them into boxes. So it's very accurate. And that information, that if there's any faults or if there's uh, more rejects than, than there's supposed to be, uh, that information is fed back automatically and the, the supervisor or the production manager is advised. And they can stop and they, say, they can say, why are there so many faults? Whereas before, that, that, that was an unknown. That was somebody looking for faults. But yeah. now uh, the robotic arms come and pack it into the boxes and then those boxes are conveyed and the different robot might put it onto a pallet. So there's less human involvement. Yeah. And then the pallet, uh, or another robot uh, will automatically wrap that pallet. Yeah. So as before, whereas 30 years ago, people were doing that. And yeah, and, uh, yeah, and, and food is a lot safer and it's a lot more... Um, accurate. There's more accuracy. And the now. good thing is that it can con continuously go even overnight or 24 7 yeah. without yeah. fatigue. Yes, yep. yeah. And um, processes are sped up and uh, then product can be produced a lot faster. Absolutely, very the, important. The one thing that really influences that as well is um, we're all consumers and we want to know that we're getting value for money. So the more process automation we can achieve, um, the quicker we can make things, the cheaper we can make things, and the cheaper we can supply it to the, the market. So that's probably one of the areas that we have to concentrate on mm -hmm. as well. What is good value for money, and how can we make things as cost-effective as possible? Yeah. So sometimes that does involve um, sourcing materials that are maybe better for what the application is, or cheaper than for what the application is, and working with industry partners. So food technologists in general work with across the spectrum of um, you know, everything from suppliers to the engineers on the line, to the procurement people who are getting your ingredients in, to the quality team who are working with it. So it's definitely um, the scope of who's involved in manufacturing has definitely increased because there's so much more people involved now. There's so much more parts of skill sets that weren't involved 30 years ago. Yeah, and I think the collaboration side of thing that's what's creating all these different career paths, which actually leads me to my next question, is within this very specific industry, how many types of, and what type of career paths are there? Um, that let's say some, a student listening to this right now, they're interested in entering this industry. What kind of avenues, what kind of pathways can they expect? I'll start with that one, a little bit about my own history over 30 years and, and where it's taken me over 30 years. So um, I studied food science in Ireland 30 years ago, and um, I started working in a quality role. So that meant looking after the quality of the product, sometimes on the production line, doing some analytical chemistry type analysis within the laboratory environment. Um, so my first role was in quality, uh, and that's a very, very big area of the industry. 
My second role was in microbiology because I was working for a company that um, it so happened that they were sending all of their micro analysis, so all of their bacteria, antibacterial analysis kind of thing off site and sending it to a third party. And I had the skill set to do that in house. So I got a great opportunity to set a lab up. And I was only like maybe three or four years out of uni at that stage. So it was this lovely opportunity for me to really get involved in the microbiology side of things. The next career path that I took, just one thing led to another. And I went into analytical chemistry, which was working for a research body that um, it was for the sugar industry. And I was working on some of the instrumentation kind of things that high school students will touch on, like gas chromatography and high pressure liquid chromatography and that kind of thing. So very much chemistry based, really lab based job. Um, so it was a whole different angle again, but really, really rewarding. And then I got an opportunity to move into developing products, which is what I've been doing for the last 14 years. So that's a totally different side of it again, where you're looking at um, creating new products and how you take it from an idea of something that you might have seen overseas. I mean, this is what happens a lot at the moment. We all travel. We're all global tourists. So we go somewhere, we taste something and we go, that would work so well in Australia. And then th the job that I'm in now is how do you get that into a production line? How do we test it? Yeah, yeah. And how do we get that onto the supermarket shelves? And the real joy of this part of the job is when you go to the supermarket and it's something that your team have created, there's mm. a real pride in that. Yeah, there's absolutely. There's a real interest amongst my friends groups. They're always saying, what are you doing? Like, what are you, what are you doing now? <laughs> what have you, what what, what's next? That, yeah. yeah. So it's a really, really interesting space. So that's just an example of, you know, 30 years. I've worked in a lot of different areas and I haven't even touched the surface of the scope of this kind of role. Yeah. And there's a, I, I, I think I saw the, pattern and the link with a lot of STEM subjects and the learning behind pretty much Absolutely. every one of your career Absolutely. paths. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that's the, that's the benefit of the food industry. It can really take you anywhere. And as Trish said, it's, it's, it can be quite diverse. And uh, some of the roles I've worked in, I, uh, not long after I graduated from university, I was uh, setting up a beef jerky room. Uh, nice. manufacturing for export to Japan. Yeah. Wow. So learning all about uh, the, the, the functional ingredients and the process involved in beef jerky and uh, as well as keeping it safe. Was that within Queensland? Yes, within Queensland, yes, yeah. 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 And, uh, and, and learning all about export and the regulations involved in, in exporting product yeah. uh, from Australia. So that's, that's a part of a food technologist's role as well. And um, other roles that I've been involved in is uh, production management and operations. So that's really hands-on and uh, making things happen and, and training as well, training operators how to do their job uh, easy uh, or easier, making it easier for them and, uh, and, and getting the best product out the door. And there's also quality roles as well. So that's a, a diverse part of uh, a food technologist role as well. And uh, technic technical sales. I've uh, been involved in technical sales and it's really fun. The people that you meet and uh, where it can take you and promoting the products that your company makes, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a fun part of uh, being a food technologist. And uh, currently in uh, research and development and the, it's a very rewarding uh, role in that you, you, a customer might have an idea that they present to you and they're not too sure what they want and you have to work out what they really want and uh, make it work so you, you're making one kilo over and over until you get it right until the customer likes what you've produced and then you make 200 kilos 500 kilos a thousand kilos yeah. 10,000 kilos <laughs> and it's fun yeah. it's fun to see that yeah. to think that started with an idea and I made one kilo and now I'm training operators how to how to make this product the best that we can make it and you're making 10,000 kilos. Wow. So that's that's a really fun part of being a food technologist. And I think it's really interesting because a lot of people, they might, they're used to cooking for themselves, maybe a family of four or five or six, that's, that's pretty normal. Mm. And then all of a sudden, if you have a dinner party and then you have 20 to 30 people, all of a sudden the scales mess, mess up yeah. the actual ingredients yeah. and the recipe doesn't taste the way you've been cooking for the last 10 yeah. years. So the sheer scale, that's, yeah. that's astonishing. And as a food technology, it's involving various stakeholders as well. So it's packaging. How do you get that product yeah. uh, into, a, into a carton? How, does it, how is it going to fit? How do, you get it into, in, how do you get it across to Western Australia from Queensland? How does all that happen? So it's involving 
different stakeholders within the food industry. And as a food technologist, you get to work with everyone. A lot of problem solving as well. Yeah, a lot of problem mm. solving. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What about yourself? Yeah. I probably just would like to add one more thing because yeah, you sure. said, okay, when the listeners are wondering how they can get into the food industry, so I might just start, you know, a little bit broader. Yeah. Um, the industry is very under-resourced when it comes to employment, okay? So we've got huge shortages um, and it starts from the production floor. So so if, if the listeners are thinking, oh, I probably would like to give it a try, so so what do I do? Just get a job in, in the first factory you can find and just try it for yourself. So that's definitely an option. Um, start from pr the production floor and then you can learn slowly, okay, what would you like, what, what would I like to do? Would I like to go down the path of product development or the compliance might be more interesting or I enjoy really leading people. Maybe I'm going to become a leading hand and a production supervisor and that sort of stuff. Or like I like numbers. Maybe I can go into procurement and accounting and that sort of stuff. So there are a lot of opportunities. Um, and also um, it's supported by the uh, vocational education um, and training system. So, so um, I believe that a lot of high school are running various um, certificates, so so students can start um, studying different units of certificate. I think three in food science and technology, I believe. Um, also, a lot of a lot of which you are involved in. A lot of um, schools are doing uh, field trips. So, if you can get into a production facility and see it for yourself, that that's fantastic as well. You don't have to necessarily study a degree, yeah. but if that's what you want to do, and if science is your friend or engineering is your friend, just go for it. So that that would be mine. So, <laughs> and you're the lady to actually talk about if they actually want to enter the industry in a bit more of a formal sense. Is that right? Well, uh, look, I I can I guess you know there are career advisors you know in the school system and that sort of stuff. But obviously, if the listeners are interested in knowing a little bit more information, they can always um, get in touch. And um, um, you know, I'm, as I said, I'm involved in in various working groups um, helping Queensland government to decide what what they should be funding, where the skill shortages are, and that sort of stuff. So I'm more than happy to. Um, you know, answer questions if, if the listeners have questions and I'm sure that you will be putting the contact Absolutely. details below. <laughs> yes, perfect. So we've added a, another fourth special guest here and uh, we're joined by Juju. So thank you for joining us as well. And uh, can we start off with a little bit of background of yourself? What's your story? Absolutely. Hi, my name is Juju and I'm part of the R&D team at Early um, as the product development technologist here. So... Obviously, I have a background in um, Bachelor of Food Science and Technology from the University of Queensland. So, and I'm, a, I'm four years since my graduation now, but I still feel very new to the industry. Awesome. And um, what made you get into this industry? Was it because you had some liking towards working in food or was it um, a different path? How did, that, how did you come about making that choice? Well, actually, I had no intention of uh, going down this path because, like, who even knows the food industry? <laughs> What's that? Yep. So I was, like, there in my classroom in year 12 thinking, oh, my God, what am I going to do with my life? <laughs> and all I knew was I liked food. Yep. Uh, I have a passion for food ever since I was very young. And... But at the same time, I didn't want to become a chef or be part of hospitality because, you know, that's a very um, physical type role. And um, so one day my chemistry teacher uh, said to me that this option was available, food science. Yeah. Perfect. And so I just jumped on board yep. and it's been a dream ever since. <laughs> Love it. Well, I'm really glad to hear that. And, and can we break down some of the things you learned within high school? So obviously that was your chemistry teacher telling you to go mm. into food. Yeah. So people might think that might come from a home economics teacher or someone oh. teaching those skills. So yeah. how did that come about? Was that confusing for you at a year 12 level that a chemistry teacher was telling you about the food industry? Yeah, it was quite because <laughs> everyone at my school was warning me not to do it. They're like, oh, you're so talented. You should do more with yourself and oh, trying, wow. to, trying to steer me away from yeah. um, uh, food technology. But my chemistry teachers uh, knew me very well. And she said, this is the industry for you. 
Love it. Yeah. Love it. And I think that's very similar to my story as well. I wanted to be um, get into medicine. Yeah. That was my thought process at that time. But it was a design teacher that showed me the pathways to those. So this goes to show the sheer amount of influence that the educator has over the decisions, the, the year 12s, 11s, and even the trades um, students make before they know and choose their career path. So what are some of the subjects you learned or skill sets within the tertiary education? So you had made the decision and then how did that work out after you started to study in it? Mm, so yeah, um, definitely it's very strong in uh, science background. So everything you learn in high school is definitely applied to chemistry, physics, microbiology. Um, and then at uni, you just uh, learn more and you elaborate on that. You've got food chemistry, um, more food specific uh, engineering and food microbiology, all the pathogens uh, yep. and stuff like that. Awesome. And one of the questions I had for you ladies was actually, do you think 21st century education, what we teach in schools and uh, universities right now is actually aligned with what's required within the industry because this is one of the things that educators constantly want to learn is are we actually preparing our students and graduates for their career paths? Do you think it's actually aligned or are there, are there misalignments that need to be addressed? Yeah, I might just start with that one if yep. I can. Um, <laughs> I come from the Czech Republic and um, back there, we've got people studying food engineering. And um, usually, and, and it actually happens in a lot of other countries than Australia. In Australia, you tend to study either food science or food technology or both. Um, and sometimes nutrition as well, um, just to kind of add a third one. Um, so the difference is that usually overseas, it's a five-year degree where um, there is a very strong practical component. So you are not just learning to develop the product, but you're actually learning to design the manufacturing line as well. So hence the engineering side of the things. So um, the people come out of the university and they can be pretty much anything they want in the food industry, including engineering. So because they have learned the engineering aspect. Yeah. So I think in Australia, um, and you know, I'm sure that you guys can add to it. Um, in Australia, it kind of lacks the engineering side of the things. So we've got a lot of, um, um, well, not a lot of, a few people uh, finishing a chemical engineering degree and then coming into the food industry as chemical engineers. Right. Uh, but we don't really have a food engineering degree per se. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. That's a very good mm. insight, I think. I think um, it's such a broad um, career in terms of where it can take you. It would actually be almost impossible to prepare students for the industry 100%. What we'd love to see is more people being passionate about entering our industry and getting their basic knowledge and then coming to us and learning on the job because yeah. there's there's never going to be i mean of all the jobs that we've worked in there's never going to be a job that you the, your skills are completely transferable there's mm -hmm. always going to be more to learn which is what's really exciting about it it's not like you learn you know an accounting program and you take that with you every job you go to Wherever you go, there's going to be so much on-the-job learning. The degree or the diploma or whatever students study, the basis of the knowledge will be enough to get them into the industry and then they'll learn on the job. Yeah. You're, it's going to be different every environment you go to. Yeah, and I think that's valuable advice and insights because it's, a, it's across the board like that with a lot of industries, even, even coming from an architectural background. Universities as maybe teaches you 10% of what needs to be actually done in yeah. a day-to-day -day office. So it is something you've got to be, be, be prepared to evolve and learn and problem solve yeah. and adapt. So the resilience component, I feel like, is a mindset issue that a lot of students need to go. So that's very good. I think the passion is the most important thing. Like Juju said, she's new to our team. Yes. When I interviewed Juju, it was that passion just shined through. Yeah. So I knew she had a great background. She came to us with great experience, but I knew that we were just going to be able to teach her and, and nurture her and mentor her into a fantastic senior food technologist because she's got that passion. Yeah. You can hear her speak about it. She loves what she does. And, and the, the example of, you know, Juju loved food. So by loving food, she thought, what else can I do? 
when I was going through school and doing science subjects, I loved science and I thought, what can I do with science? And I thought I'd end up working in, um, you know, a, a laboratory that you were testing blood or, you know, um, some kind of pharmaceutical kind of environment. And that didn't really attract me. Yeah. And I, I kind of thought twice about how am I going to foster this love of science to something that also interests me. Yeah. And it was somebody I knew doing the course, a friend of the family's, and, and when she started talking about she was doing everything I loved in school, but she was relating it to food, I thought, OK, that's, for me. that's where I want to be. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. And the advantage of the food industry and one of the reasons that I uh, studied it at university out of school is I was looking at different career paths and uh, the career, career guidance officer uh, spoke with me and uh, pointed out there'll always be food. Everyone Absolutely. needs to eat. Yep. And that's the advantage of the food industry. It doesn't matter what uh, path you take whether it's the, the parts that we talked about before, the different employment um, aspects, whether it be quality, development, sales, marketing within the food industry, They'll, people always need to eat mm. and we need to get smarter at how we produce food and making it safe. So as a food technologist, uh, there will always be a job for a food technologist. Mm. And and it, it, there's no no day is the same because there's you're always looking, what's that next thing out there? What's, what's the next Coca-Cola? Mm. Yes. What's, what's the next burger that's going to, to come about? And, what's, and is there going to be enough food for everyone in the world to eat? And, and food security, is, is there enough? Um, do people, are people comfortable with it? And it's thinking of those long-term projects and uh, long-term problems associated with food. And as a food technologist, there's, it's endless where you can take it and what you can do. And it's um and you guaranteed a job basically. It's mm. it's not going to change. I think that's music to a lot of people yeah. in this current climate. So Absolutely. that's a very good thing. Because when we're at school, uh, the, our parents might tell us the job that you do now is not going to be the same job. That, that job might not be around in twenty years. But I know as a food technologist, there will always be a need mm -hmm. for a food technologist, and there will always be employment. So if if you do do the degree, it's uh, it, it's it's well worth it because. You, you will find your passion and you'll find the path in the, the path that you follow. You'll find what you what you like and what you're good at. There's so many different uh, avenues to follow within food technology. Perfect. And I think to add to that, what a degree in food science will teach you is where to look for the information. Not not everything. It can't. And, and it'll change again in five years. And we'll need to evolve with it. But what studying food science will do for you is give you the tools to find the information that you need and grow with the industry, which is what we, exactly what we've had to do yeah. over the time mm -hmm. working in the industry. And the current environment, there's not enough food technologists in Australia. No, yeah. mm -hmm. there's not enough. There's a shortage of food technologists, and uh, the number of students currently studying the degree at universities throughout Australia, there's not enough. Yeah, there's, there's not enough. So it, it, it's and a, that's that's a very good thing to know. Yes. That what they're studying has a very good outcome at the end and there are plenty of opportunities available. One of the last questions I wanted to ask Juju was, is, is there looking, having actually come from the tertiary education system relatively recently, um, do you think it's actually aligned and prepared you for your career that you want to actually build? Yeah, um, that's a very good question. I think it was uh, my um, tertiary uh, education really prepared me well for uh, my role, my entry into the food industry. As I said, it's very science-based as well as um, I had lots of practical hands-on um, knowledge as well. Um, but I hear from, from Trish and Leah that compared to years ago, um, the practical side of things has been really cut down. Yeah. And what's your one piece of advice for students or graduates or anyone looking at entering the industry? What's your one piece of advice for them? I just would say, give it a go. It like, a go. like, yeah, and, and, and um, definitely if you've got the opportunity to go and see a, a, a food manufacturing facility as part of your um, school cur curriculum, absolutely do it. Give it a go. What about yourself? Yeah, just if you're passionate about food and you love science, it's a really exciting career. And one thing I would say is it's also a really good career to travel with. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a skill that is valuable anywhere in the world. Yeah. 
And manufacturing in Australia has changed in that there's uh, multinational companies that uh, mm. are abroad now. So the opportunity to work in Australia and uh, a, a country abroad, it's the opportunities are there. And uh, take, take the opportunity and you never know where it will lead. Mm. Mm. If you want to work in a job where you'll be bouncing out of bed in the morning, <laughs> this is the industry to be in. Love it. Perfect. <laughs> That's the note to end on, and I think, and I think I've personally learned a lot about the food industry myself. Um, how do, how can people get in touch if they want to learn more about it and extend the learning from what they've just heard from you, ladies? Yeah, look, I guess um, the the food industry association here is to to really assist the industry, and part of it is really spreading the information and the knowledge. Uh, so, if any of the students or teachers have any questions, um, you know, please contact us at the bottom of, yep. of the video or a podcast um, and we can always, if, if, if we can't answer um, the question as, as, you know, the, the Food Industry Association, I can always pass it on to our members and or to the ladies or anyone that's, that's, got, that's got a little bit more inside than us. Perfect. The um, High School Teachers Association of Food Science or Home Economics or whatever they call them now, are, um, they've reached out to us and they are coming to have a walkthrough uh, the factory in September when they have their annual conference in Brisbane. And I'd encourage any home economics food science teachers who are involved in that to engage in that because this is the opportunity to talk to the industry and really get some first-hand knowledge that they can bring back to their students. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Thanks, you. Richard. That's it for today's episode. Now it's time to take action and build on the learnings to get inspired. First up, jump on to rashansenanayaka.com forward slash podcast and check out the show notes, links and other relevant learning materials from this amazing episode. Next, if you learned something new today, click that subscribe button and set yourself up to receive live notifications on future episodes as well as more opportunities to learn from our amazing guests, brands and speakers. Last but not least, it's time to have your say. Join the conversation and share your thoughts and feedback on today's episode with a review, all while joining many others with a five-star rating for Inspiring Design with Rashan Senanayaka. Till next time.